Today we are going to continue this series that we started last week called You Asked For It, which is very simply, we, I ask for questions that you might have about scripture, about a social issue, which we'll talk about today, uh, or anything else that you might want to know about faith or life or anything about what the Bible says about a certain topic. Um, so originally for today, I had two questions that I worked on. And when I looked at them uh, Friday, I thought, I don't want to talk for an hour. And nobody else wants me to talk for an hour either. So, you're welcome. I'm only doing one question today. And we'll shift the second one that was for today to next week and probably add one more to that. Uh, so I, t I intended on next week being the final week because we're going to have all the questions answered, but we're not now. So we'll have an extra week of this series. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and ask, this qu ask the question that was asked. Uh, and then we will we'll just kind of sink, sink, let it soak in for a second on where we're going to go today, possibly. So here's the question that we're going to look at today. In our culture that is accepting of LGBTQ lifestyles, how can I stand on my Christian convictions without judging? Let's let that breathe for a second. We're going there today, all right? We're going there. And I, felt, I appreciate the question. Again, I don't know who asked these questions, and so my answer is not directed toward anyone or at anyone or about anyone which is great for me and whoever asked the question, right? Um, but I do want to answer, um, I do want to answer directly and also broadly, and I am going to answer sort of in a general way first and then in a very specific way to the specific question. And also there was a follow-up I didn't have room on there that we'll, we'll tackle as well about this topic. I do feel when I got this question, I was like, I've been waiting for this question every time I've done this series, it hasn't come up yet, and it's finally here. And then the second thing I thought was, I feel like I'm in a Western right now, and they're shooting at my feet, telling me to dance. That's what I felt, and it's not, I don't mean it's a wrong question, I think the, the heart behind it seems very genuine, but that's just my feeling, like they're going to watch me dance today, so prepare yourselves, I'm going to try not to hurt myself while we do this, uh, answer this question. So this topic of sexual identity, sexual lifestyles, is a sensitive issue, and for many, it can be a very personal issue, and so we'll talk about why that's so important here in just a second, and... Despite what you may think, it can be more complicated than we give it credit for as an overall sort of way of thinking about life. Um, especially increasingly as it is becoming more accepted in the general public, there is this question that becomes much more almost obvious that a Christian would need to answer. Why do I think about this issue, and how do I go about expressing that view? And so we're going to look at that today. And again, I want to answer generally first about this topic for just a couple minutes, and then specifically get to the heart of the question that was asked. First, let me just say this generally about the church and sexual issues, especially LGBTQ issues. In, in my estimation, looking at recent church history, especially in Western culture, in American culture, I think the church has been guilty of one or two errors on this topic. And the first one is this. It seems like times some churches, if not all churches, or the big C church, at times can be intentionally insensitive to this issue. Again, I mentioned this is a complicated thing to discuss. It is very personal. And until recently, it was a fairly private issue. Churches didn't talk about it because it wasn't a much of, it was kind of a thing you don't really talk about. You keep it to yourself. No matter what your view is on sexuality or preferences or lifestyles or whatever, it just was something that's very private. And it's not that way anymore. And so I feel like the church needs to be sensitive to this issue, and many times it is not. And the other, the second, and we'll talk, I'll explain that more in a second after we read a scripture. So I'm not just going to leave that hanging out there, okay? We're going to define what I mean by that. The second critical error I think the church has made with this issue is sometimes we're not just intentionally insensitive, but sometimes we're unintentionally unfair when it comes to this issue of LGBTQ and sexual preference. I want to read a portion of scripture here. This is Galatians chapter 5. You'll probably recognize some of these verses, maybe not the first ones, maybe, but especially the middle section that we're going to read, you'll recognize this for sure, talking about the fruit of the Spirit. But let's look at this, Galatians 5, starting at verse 19. Paul says this, when you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division. He keeps going. He's not done yet. Envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these. Let me tell you again, as I have before, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. But 
the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed the passions and desires of their sinful nature to his cross and have crucified them there. I want to put up the, the slide that lists the very first part of that list and then again go back to the two errors that I believe the church, the big C church, not this church or any particular church, but you would know of some if, as I describe sort of these mindsets. First, I think, again, the, the first issue, that an error that I think the modern Western church has with this issue is sometimes we can be intentionally insensitive. Maybe it's unintentional, but sometimes it's very intentional. Because we will say, that's just wrong, they're wrong, I don't care about their life experience, I don't care about their upbringing, I don't care about their history, I don't want to hear their story, I don't want to hear excuses, it's just wrong, because the Bible says so. It's not extremely sensitive. And I would say it goes against, we'll talk, I don't want to get ahead of myself, even though I probably will over and over uh, again today, but it's not really the pattern of Jesus to behave that way. If we look at the pattern of Jesus' teachings, he is... And I am getting way ahead of myself here. We're going to close on this idea, but I'm going to start out to the front because maybe it's important to say it more than once. The pattern of Jesus with any sinful person is he's pretty grace-giving to them. The people that he is the hardest on are the religious people who don't live the way that they should. Not that, not that he's pointing out their sin like, oh, you have this. he's saying your pride is your sin. Your self-righteousness is your sin. Your lack of grace is your sin. You're looking down your nose at others and their issues is your sin. So if we look at the pattern of Jesus, and we even look, he, he sees this uh, in several cases here, but one, it's very interesting. There's a woman caught in the act of adultery and uh, like caught in the act. So there's no question what's been going on here. There's no issue like he said, she said, no, no. She's basically pulled from the bedroom by the religious leaders and taken out in the street to be stoned to death. But what does Jesus do? He keeps her from being stoned to death, first of all, by the religious people. He gets on to them for doing so. He says, "Who, any of you without sin, let him pass the first stone. Obviously, they, they can't meet that requirement. They are with sin, and so they can't stone the woman. And then what, is, what does he say? Where do all your accusers go? She says, well, they're gone. And he says, well, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Some Christians and some churches don't, don't act that way with this issue. And I think that we should. I think we should maybe reconsider our view on how we treat people who live a different kind of lifestyle. And I think if we behave more like Jesus, we, it might be easier for us um, to live with people that live this kind of lifestyle. So, uh, we want to be sensitive because, again, even Paul says in Romans 2 verse 4, he says, and we, we sang it this morning, it's so funny that we sang this just now. God's kindness leads us to repentance. Romans 2 4, look it up, it's there, okay? So what Paul's not saying is my judgment of others is going to help them repent. That my, my, my telling them how terrible they are and how sinful they are is not going to lead them to repentance. It's God's kindness that leads them to repentance. And again, it's God doing that, but we extend that. He extends that through us in many ways. So we want to be sensitive to this issue. Then the second thing is, again, sometimes churches or Christians can be unintentionally unfair about this issue. Let's go back to this list. The first thing on this list that we see here, uh, the results are very clear. Sexual immorality. Notice, homosexual is not listed here. Lesbianism is not listed here. Transgenderism is not listed. Sexual immorality. So, many times Christians are unfair because we elevate the LGBTQ, those, that group of sins, as worse than other sins. Or even worse than other sexual sins. Paul puts it all together here. So anything, and we talked about last week, again, sin, we talk about sin normally is, well, it's breaking God's law, it's disobeying God. Well, it is, but really in a big picture thing, it is living against God's original design. So any form of sexual immorality that is not prescribed by Scripture is equally sinful. All of it is. Not just one because it's the same gender, but any of it would be wrong. So anything that's, again, and Scripture from beginning to end tells us when you put it all together pretty clearly... Any sexual expression outside of a heterosexual, monogamous marriage relationship would be sinful. There, I said it. So you don't have to worry about, where does he stand on this issue? I'm really confused. It's pretty clear. But again, the unfair factor that sometimes we all have in our own prejudiced, sinful hearts is that, well, one is worse than the other. 
when it's not. There's only one time, 1 Timothy chapter 1, only one time in all of Scripture that I found actually lists homosexuality explicitly. Now, it's, it's, it's implicit in the Old Testament, in Leviticus, that's the, kind of the church go-to thing. You know, Leviticus says if you, you know, a man lies with a man, is with a woman, it's an abomination. Boom! There God said it, okay? Now, it's explained, right? And even um, this list would, would hint at it. Even Romans chapter 1 explains homosexual behavior as unnatural. It's very clear. But it's only, it there's only a once in the Bible. And yet we want to take that one thing and then superimpose it on all the other ones as, oh, it's obviously that. Well, it is, but it's not only that. So we can't just make this what we want it to mean to fit this argument that we had about a certain social issue. It's bigger than that. And again, I will say that it's not just an LGBTQ that is being propped up, right, in our culture. It's all sort of sexual immorality. But again, it's all equally, equally immoral in the eyes of Scripture, according to Scripture, okay? So, Scripture affirms that any sexual morality is sinful, and it's all equally sinful. Now, that statement doesn't please a lot of people on one, one side or the other, because we want to make it worse, and it's not, or people don't want to think it's sinful. But if you're going to be a person that believes in Scripture, you need to believe Scripture. That's where we stand. Um, so, with that being said, oh, and I'll say this. Let's talk about Jesus for a second. Jesus, as far as I know, as far as I've read and studied, never mentions this issue. Ever. Not once. Is it recorded? Now, he may have been asked a question, and Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John didn't write it down or whatever. And some would say, well, it wasn't a problem back in Jesus' day. And I would say, baloney. Have you read any, anything from the first century that's not in the Bible? It was a huge issue at the time. Even in the book of Genesis, we see that the issue of homosexuality comes up as an issue. Before there's a law against it that God wrote in stone or whatever, it's like, it's there. It's prevalent. So it, it is, it's been an issue from the very beginning because sin has been a problem since the very beginning. And again, it's not that it's a worse or lesser. It's that it's, it just is what it is. It is. It is against the law of nature and the law of God. And so anything that would be on this list or any of the lists in the Bible, don't do that. It's equally offensive um, to God. Um, so let me get to the personal nature then and answer the, the question about how do I believe that? If you, if you don't believe it, this is great for you to hear too because you can hear, you can see how we can differ on views and still not hate each other, right? We can still differ on views that are important, that do matter, and still find a way to coexist, all right? Which I hate that bumper sticker, but anyway, there nonetheless. <laughs> um, how do I hold to a belief that may differ from other people and not judge them? So Jesus is very clear on how we do that, uh, and he just kind of says it, Matthew 7, verse 1, do not judge others, right? There you go, just don't. And you will not be judged, for you will be treated as you treat others. It's kind of the inverse of the golden rule, treat others the way you want to be treated. Jesus says, reciprocation works both ways. So how you want to be treated, treat others that way, but how you treat them is how you should expect them to be treated. That's how it works. The standard you used in judging. So I thought he said don't judge, but now he's saying how you judge. Well, that's what he means. How you judge others. The standard by which you use in judging is the standard by which you will be judged. And here, I love this illustration. Why worry about a speck in your friend's eye when you have a log in your own eye? How can you think of saying to your friend, let me help you get rid of that speck in your eye when you can't see past the log in your own eye? And then he uses this word, get ready to be offended, hypocrite. First, get rid of the log in your own eye. Then you will see well enough to deal with the speck in your friend's eye. And just in case we can't see the visual, we're going to see the visual. This is what we're talking. This is what Jesus is talking about. By the way, what do me and this piece of wood have in common? We're both studs. All right. So, uh, just a couple of studs up here preaching today. Nailed it. Nailed it. It's even better. So this is what Jesus is talking about. I'm going to stand up for this. All right? So I don't know if you can see, I have a toothpick in this hand. So this is the speck. This is the log. So Jesus is saying, my sin is like this, having this in my eye, and I'm concerned about this being in your eye. You've got so many problems and issues, but it's like this compared to this. Now, what Jesus is not saying is that your sin is better or worse. That's not the point. It's not what he's saying. He's not saying their sin is less than yours. You have a thousand issues sticking out of your face, and they only have a couple, leave them alone. 
So here's the issue. It's, it's every sin. So here's the thing. Your sin, let's talk about human nature. Your sin may only, comparatively to somebody else's, be like this. It may be like, I cheated on a test in fifth grade one time. And that's it. Like, I, I, it's pretty much Jesus then me on the perfection scale. Maybe that is you. I mean, there's a lot of really good people in here. So maybe your, your sin is like that. Here's what Jesus is saying. Even if your sin, as far as degree of sin, is like that, and I just dropped it, is like that, it should look like this to you. That's what he's saying. Your own sinfulness, your own shortcomings, your own imperfections, no matter how small or insignificant they may be, compared to others, because we do that, don't we? It's hard as humans not to compare what's really not as bad as what they did. And we, it may be true. We even have laws with different degrees of penalties because we... That's how we are. But no matter how big or small your sin actually may be, it should appear like this to you at all times. And no matter how big or small someone else's sin may appear to you or others around you compared to anything else, it should look like a speck or a toothpick. So I'm not as concerned about you anymore because I've got some sawing to do. I've got some work to do. I'm not a good wood woodworker, but I want to give it my best because i got this sticking out of my eye. That's what Jesus is saying. It's not that one sin is worse than the other. It's that your sin is yours. My sin is mine. I can't save you from your sins. You can't save me from my sins. Only Jesus can do that. So again, we want to put this thing, well, that's a 10 out of 10. That's a 5 out of 10. So their half is bad or they're twice as good. It's like, no, no, no. Everybody's, as far as I'm concerned, everybody else has a little thing, a little stick in their eye, and I've got a huge plank. And that's what Jesus is trying to communicate. If I judge, if I take the time judging others, if I would take it and judge myself, that would be a better use of my time, is what Jesus is saying. And it's true with this social issue. It's true with this issue of sexual preference and sexual expression and sexual lifestyle. It's equally true with that as well. No matter how deplorable you may think that action is, no matter how uh, terrible you may think that is, again, the focus is not about their sin and how it offends me. My focus is my sin and how it offends God. That's a better use of our time. And I think, again, a better uh, view of what Jesus is trying to do. Now, with that being said, I don't want us to think, well, I can't help people try to get better. Or I can't counsel them. I can't pray for them. It's not what we're saying either. But again... Because if that were true, my job would be pointless. What am I doing trying to help people and, you know, whatever? So it's like, that's not what he's saying. I'm happy to help those that ask for assistance, but I'm not going to go out of my way to point out the problem that they need to fix. That's not my, that's judging them. That's not my job. So if, if I can help someone along the way, and if, the, and if it works better in relationship as well, picketing on the streets is not an effective means to do much of anything, especially when you're trying to change behavior, or thought process, or lifestyles. It's more a matter of relationship does that over time. I have the authority to speak into them because they've given it to me. I'm not trying to tell them what to do. I'm trying to lovingly help them with their life because they've allowed me in. That's how this, really, this Christian thing should work. Paul explains it this way, similar idea, phrase in a different way that we'll look at for a second. Philippians chapter 2, verse 12. He says, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. So, again, Paul's saying, I've got enough imperfections, I need to work on me, and not worry about working on you. And this is Paul talking. Again, it probably really is with him, Jesus, and then Paul, right? Probably, even though... He wasn't a great guy before his conversion. But nonetheless, he's saying, I have enough issues. I'm going to work on me. You work on you. And really, it's, he says, not even us doing the work. It's who? It's God doing the work anyway. So as much as I'm going to try to work on other people and fix them, it doesn't work. It doesn't make any difference. Only God can do the work on them that he needs to do. Only God can do the work on me that he needs to do. And if we can keep that distinction clear, it'll be a lot better. So I want that to, to be my focus in my life. To help those that need it, yes, and help those that want it through relationship over time in a loving way, and not to tell them, hey, fix this, change that, you're wrong, that's bad, get better, do better, be better, God you know, may or may not love you, may or may not accept you. That's not, not my job description, way above my pay grade. So we want to have that be our focus instead. Then the, the follow-up question then that we'll, we'll kind of end with is this. 
not just how I not judge, but then the question was also, how do I really love others without accepting that sin? How do I love others without accepting their sin? And I would just point you to a, a famous company you might know called Nike. I would answer that question, how do I love without accepting sin, the same way that Nike would try to sell you stuff. It's three words. Just do it. Right? It's very simple. Just do it. How do I love without accepting sin? Just, just do it. Okay? So here, here is our example for that to kind of flesh that out. John 1.14. Uh, this is John's introduction of Jesus. So here's what he says. The Word, that's Jesus, became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father full of grace and truth. That and is a very important word in that sentence. I want to read this in the New Living Translation to look at the same, those same two words that we're focusing on said in a different way. It says this, So the Word became human and made His home among us. He was full of unfailing love and faithfulness. And we have seen His glory, the glory of the Father's one and only Son. So if we put these two together, what we see, truth and faithfulness. Jesus was always true to the Scripture. He was always faithful. He was never sinful. He never disobeyed any part of the law ever in his existence. That's what made him the perfect sacrifice for our sins, our imperfection. So he was truth. He, he, he lived out truth and faithfulness. He never compromised. But also we see here the and part is grace with truth and with unfailing love is faithfulness. So grace and truth. So he showed unfailing love. So he never compromised. He was always full of truth. But he was also always full of grace. He never failed to love those around him, even the most sinful. He's full of grace and truth. And Jesus tells us to do the same thing. The second greatest, the first greatest commandment is love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. The second greatest commandment is love your neighbor as yourself. And then he goes on to tell a story about two different people from two different cultures who don't see eye to eye, don't have the same belief systems, don't get along, and yet they find a way to, the, the one who is hated is the hero of the story, helps out the one that hates him. So Jesus says, hey, that's your neighbor. That's a mic drop moment if I've ever heard one in my life. Because the guy says, who's my neighbor? Let me tell you, the person that you hate, that hates you, that's your neighbor. The person that you are constantly at odds with at all times over every belief system, that's your neighbor. The person that lives a way that you would never imagine living that way, that's your neighbor. The person that has a completely different lifestyle than you in every way possible, that's your neighbor. Love them, is what Jesus says. That's it. That's all it is. Love them. So he, he didn't make this thing about you have to love them but not be truthful. You have to love them but compromise scripture. You have to love them but not really hold true to beliefs that you believe. That wouldn't be honest. It wouldn't be fair. It wouldn't be right. But it just says to love them. And here's the thing. Again, we're talking about the LGBTQ question here. How do I love without accepting the sin? But we do this all the time. All the, Hopefully we do, right? Especially if you're a Christian, hopefully you do this all the time. Because maybe one of your neighbors has a huge rage problem. Hopefully you love them, and you, but you don't accept that behavior, do you? But you also probably, maybe, maybe you do, maybe you don't, uh, always want to point that out to them. And you've got a rage problem, bro. You've got a real problem there. I don't know if I can be a good neighbor to you. We don't do that. We just love them, and we're cordial to them, and we hang out with them, and invite them to dinner. We do it all the time. Your coworker who's not always ethical, hopefully you still try to love them. You don't accept their unethical behavior. You don't accept backstabbing and gossip at your job from other people, but you still love those people and coexist with them without telling them, hey, you're a big backstabber, bro. You know what, ma'am? You know, you're, you're just a terrible human being. I just don't like you very much because you, you gossip all the time. We don't do that. We love them, right? We accept them despite their flaws, and with their flaws included. So this issue of sexual preference or lifestyle is no different. I can love that neighbor that doesn't believe like me, that doesn't live like me, without rejecting them, without rejecting truth on the matter. Because here's the thing. For better or for worse, most people have an idea or an assumption about what a Christian believes about that kind of lifestyle. They're not always right, but they, they usually have the idea, well, they, they know it's wrong and they probably won't like me. That second part's the issue that we're trying to work through here, that we're trying to kind of repair that image, is that, yeah, we don't agree and I still love you. Like we, we really don't see eye on this issue at all, but 
man, you're, you're a part of the human race, and God made you with a purpose, and God loves you, and, and you know, I'm not, I'm not here to judge, and he is, and I'm going to work on me, and you're going to work on you, and, and we're going to see how it turns out in the end here. That's kind of all we're called to do. And it seems like a soft approach, and I would say that's, that's okay. It's fine. Again, Jesus is full of grace and truth. And if you look at the main issue that people in the religious circles had with Jesus, it was that he accepted the sinful people, that he was willing to dine with them. He's willing to hang out with them. He's invited to their get-togethers all the time, and he doesn't reject them. Well, is it going to be a gay party? Because I can't go to that. He didn't. You don't ever hear him say anything like that. Is there going to be X at this party? Because if there is, I don't know if I can be around because i got a reputation. He doesn't ever do that. And so he's always around sinners, and that's one of the things that the really religious people have the issue with, is that he accepted the sinner. And he's like, that's kind of my point. Like that, I'm, yes, I'm here for you too, self-righteous, religious sinner. That's what I'm not, again, I'm not trying to name call anyone in here. I don't know who asked the question. It's a great question. So none of this is personal. I just want to make that clear. Is that, is that clear? Yes. Okay, good. Because I've, all week I've been like, man, I like this question, but I hate it at the same time. Anyway, so, that's a good question to, to answer. We're almost done. I'm almost, I'm, yeah, we're almost done. All right. Here's the thing. Many times, social issues like this one, and there are others, can be a distraction from the truth of the gospel. Because right. the gospel is not God loved the world that he gave his only son, that if you, know, if you believe in, and you do this, that it's like if you believe in him, you have eternal life. Now, again, you can fill in the blanks there on what Stephen's thinking at the moment, but Sexuality is not the focus of the gospel. Mm -hmm. Sexual preference is not like he came to do this, but he may not. He may not deal with that. It, it's just not. And so many times these social issues become dangerous distractions because we're focused on fixing this social problem that we're not really sharing the gospel. Mm -hmm. That we're too busy boycotting companies that support this. That we're not really worried about the gospel as much as maybe we should be and ought to be. And so we want to, again, the, the gospel is the focus. Christ's love is the focus. The grace of Jesus is the focus. And so that's what it says. He's full of grace and truth. You can love without compromising your beliefs because Jesus is our example of that. So let me close with, with three quick thoughts as we close. And it's all about this idea of grace. And that's this. Two that I'll say together and one I'll say for the end. I want us to embrace the messiness of grace. Embrace the messiness of grace. Situations aren't always simple. Issues aren't always black and white. There is complexity to the human race. There are reasons people believe the way that they do. There are reasons people behave the way they behave. There are reasons people choose to live the way that they do. Now, that is not saying, again, that we have to shirk our responsibility and not be people of truth, but it is part of the equation. We have to embrace it. It's messy. People, relationships are hard. They're messy. They're complicated because people are messy and hard and complicated at times, including me and you. So we want to embrace the fact that, yeah, this may not always be the easiest thing to talk about or deal with or work through, and that's okay. Messy grace can sometimes be messy, and similarly, it can also be very uncomfortable. So embrace the uncomfortability of grace. Actually, I don't know if that's a real word, but it sounds good. It'd be really good in Scrabble, right? So, but embrace the uncomfortability of grace. Again, it's like, ooh, I don't, I'm not sure about that. I don't know how I feel about that. That's okay. It's not, we're not called to do what's easy. We're called to do what's right, which is sometimes and usually more difficult. So we want to embrace the reality of the messiness and uncomfortability of grace. But then here's the last thing I want to leave us with to kind of sum up. We don't want to just embrace those things. We want to also acknowledge our own limits of grace and therefore our own need for grace. Because if I'm honest, there are times where I, maybe I have been and maybe will be prejudiced against someone for some reason. That's a limit to grace. God's grace is greater than sometimes mine is. God's love is sometimes deeper than mine is. God's understanding is way more exponentially huge than mine is, which shows my need to follow his direction. Again, in Isaiah, God says, my ways are higher than your ways. My thoughts are greater than your thoughts. Well, that's a good thing, because I have limits. I have limits, even with grace. Because there's some people at certain times, 
maybe on a very specific situation that I don't really want to forgive them. That's a limit to my grace, which shows my own need of grace. Again, it's kind of the speck and, and plank sort of idea here being fleshed out as we close. There are times where I don't understand how someone can think this is okay or this is, this is not okay and they have such a big deal. It's a limit to my own grace and therefore proof of my own need for grace in my own life. So I want to follow him. I, want, I need his love. I need his grace in my life. So really my prayer, even for me, and I think for all of us that follow Jesus, is simply, God, forgive me whenever I am prejudiced against someone for any reason. Forgive me. That's not your heart. That's not what you want. God, forgive me for sometimes having a judgmental attitude toward others when I think they are way worse than I am. It's called self-righteousness. It's not about that. So forgive me, God, if I ever have that sort of thought or attitude or inclination in my heart, because it, it, it resides in all of us if we're not careful. God, help me if I resist extending grace. Forgive me for resisting that. Forgive me for holding things against people. Not even just this issue, but in general. Help me to be a grace giver because I have been a recipient of that grace. So really, the, the thing is, God, help me to love who you love in grace and truth. And help me to accept who you accept in grace and truth. Help me to extend grace and truth. Again, we're not compromising our beliefs here. That's not what I'm saying. But I am saying there's a way to be grace-giving about living in truth. There is a way that focuses on the gospel without getting caught in the web of all these other things that don't really matter that big of a deal as much as God's love and God's grace to anyone who's committed any sin at any time, in any way, that's the point of the Gospels, that we're all in need of God's grace, equally. And if we can follow that, flesh that out in our lives, and do the best we can by God's grace, to be grace-giving, I think that we'll see maybe better reception toward people in our lives, even though they don't believe like us, and know that we don't agree with them. If we can extend grace in those conversations, it'll go a long way in building relationships, building bridges, starting those conversations, which... You never know how God can use a random conversation with your neighbor, your coworker, somebody that you meet on the street. That you're, we're totally opposite. Maybe that interaction, if it's, if it's full of grace and truth, you never know what God can do with that. So let's not limit what God wants to do with our own prejudices and our own thoughts and our own sinfulness. But let's extend grace while we live out truth.